Hello, welcome everyone, uh, students, faculty, friends, to the University of Minnesota Law School's 2020 Horatio Ellsworth Keller Lecture. This year, our lecture is on marriage equality in Minnesota. I'm Dean Gary Jenkins. This lecture series was established by Curtis Keller, class of 40, to honor his father. We have a great program today and we are honored to have with us national scholars and folks who were among the earliest activists involved in the campaign for rights of LGBT persons to marry, including Jack Baker, class of 72, and his spouse, Michael McConnell. Although they are not on the program, I wanna thank and acknowledge two individuals who were in many ways uh, absolutely uh, the driving forces behind this year's Keller Lecture. First, Professor Brett McDonald, who helped pull this together. And the second is Olivia Kurtz, our events coordinator. Thank you both so much. Now, the history of marriage equality in Minnesota is a terrific case study and a lesson on the long and windy path that legal reform and changes in social attitudes may travel. So I was asked to provide a short primer on the history of same-sex marriage to set the stage for our discussion. As you may not know, the Minnesota Supreme Court was the first state court in the nation to issue a gay marriage decision in 1971. In Baker v. Nelson, the court held that Minnesota statutes limiting marriage license only to persons of the opposite sex did not violate the U.S. Constitu Constitution. Our guests today, Jack Baker and Michael McConnell, were the plaintiffs in this case. Now, their case was appealed up to the U.S. Supreme Court, but was dismissed. 22 years later, in 1993, the Supreme Court of Hawaii ruled that the state could not ban same-sex marriages without a compelling reason to do so. Although a gay marriage was never performed in Hawaii, the issue gained national attention prompted the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, in 1996, barring the federal government from recognizing same-sex marriages legalized by the states. The Minnesota legislature, like many other states, passed its own version of DOMA in 1997. Fast forward to 2003, after the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts ruled in Goodrich v. Department of Public Health that the denial of civil marriage rights to same-sex partners were, was unconstitutional in that state. Then in 2010, three Minnesota same-sex couples filed Benson v. Alverson in state district court, arguing that Minnesota's ban on gay marriage violated due process, equal protection, and freedom of association rights, but their argument was unsuccessful. Also in 2010, a federal judge in Gill v. Office of Personnel Management uh, ruled that portions of the federal DOMA uh, were unconstitutional. While the federal government initially filed an appeal, it was the White House under President Obama that later directed the US Department of Justice to stop defending DOMA in court. Then in 2011, uh, Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota legislature passed uh, SF 1308, uh, proposing an amendment to the Minnesota constitution that marriage is between one man and one woman. That amendment was rejected by Minnesota voters in the 2012 election, with 52% of voters voting against the amendment, making Minnesota the first US state to reject a constitutional ban on same-sex marriage. Then in 2013, the Minnesota legislature considered several bills to address marriage, including establishing civil unions, uh, replacing all marriage with civil unions, and a bill making marriage, uh, making Minnesota's marriage law gender neutral. It was that last bill that passed. And in May 2013, it was signed into law by Governor Mark Dayton. Uh, 
And just one month later, in June 2013, the Supreme Court ruled in Windsor v. United States that DOMA was unconstitutional, providing federal recognition and equal treatment to state authorized same-sex marriages with respect to federal rights and benefits. And finally, in 2015, with Ober 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 Obergefell uh, v. Hodges, the US Supreme Court ruled that the US Constitution guarantees the right for same-sex couples to marry in all US states. And since that time, countless same-sex couples, including me, uh, have exercised their right to marry in Minnesota. Now, I'd like to turn things over to a great friend of the law school, one of our former faculty colleagues who taught at Minnesota Law for more than 15 years. He is now the Judge William Hawley Atwell Chair in Constitutional Law at SMU's Dedman School of Law. Professor Dale Carpenter, it's great to see you again. So many friends are here and excited. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi there, Dean Jenkins. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, welcome again to uh, this webinar lecture about, as Dean Jenkins said, an important event important movement, political and social movement in the history of this country and particularly our focus on the history of Minnesota. Uh, as Dean Jenkins mentioned, I, I am a professor at SMU Law School in Dallas. I did teach at Minnesota. It's my great honor to teach at the University of Minnesota Law School for 16 years and during that time uh, um, I was involved in the Minnesota marriage amendment fight in 2012 as treasurer of the anti-amendment campaign. And then I served as a legal advisor for the effort to get legislation adopted by the Minnesota legislature in 2013. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes before we, we begin. Uh, we will conclude the official part of this webinar on time at 1.45 p.m. During the webinar, we will open up for questions, or actually at the end of the webinar, we will open up for your questions for approximately the last 15 minutes as time permits. That's our hope. Um, please submit your questions if you have them uh, in, using the Q&A feature that you should see at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. And for the sake of time and efficiency, I would ask uh, that you direct your question to a specific speaker or speakers so that we can move uh, the questions along. I know that you'll have many of them. Today's webinar is being recorded and the link to the recording for this webinar will be shared via email to all registrants sometime next week. We also have enabled auto captioning, which you can see uh, in which you can see the transcript of the proceedings at the very bottom of the screen. If you are distracted in some way by seeing this transcript, uh, you can disable it simply by clicking on the live transcript feature at the bottom of your screen and you can simply disable it. Um, we are delighted, I have to say, to have an extraordinary and distinguished slate of speakers here participating today. I want to introduce them. Bill Eskridge is the John A. Garver Professor of Jurisprudence at the Yale Law School, one of the foremost authorities in constitutional law in this country, a leading authority on statutory interpretation, I would say the leading authority on statutory interpretation in this generation, and certainly one of the top LGBT rights scholars of our time or any time, and especially influential in the kinds of arguments he crafted on behalf of same-sex marriage at a time when it was not necessarily uh, the top goal of the movement. Christopher R. Riano is the executive director of the Center for Civic Education and a a lecturer in constitutional law and government 
at Columbia University. Bill and Chris will be discussing their new book, Marriage Equality from Outlaws to In-Laws. Jack Baker and Michael McConnell are America's first legally married gay couple. They were married in Minneapolis in September of 1971 and still live in Minneapolis to this day and are still married to this day. Gail Karwaski is an author and educator based in Athens, Georgia, and she met Mike and Jack in 1972, the year after they were married. Jack and Mike will, of course, be discussing their marriage, and Gail will be discussing th uh, their new book, The Wedding Heard Round the World, America's First Gay Marriage. Richard Karlbaum is the co-founder of United Strategies, which advises nonprofit groups on building coalitions, advocacy, fundraising, and strategy. He was the leader of Minnesotans United for All Families, which is the group that fought the anti-same-sex marriage amendment in 2012. Finally, Christine Almeida is the head of Almeida Public Affairs, which advises clients on public public advises clients on public affairs and public relations. In 2012, she chaired the board of directors for Minnesotans United for All Families, the campaign that I mentioned earlier. Richard and Christine will be discussing the 2012 campaign and the subsequent passage of marriage legislation in Minnesota in 2013. And with that, I will now turn it over to Bill and Chris. Welcome. Thank you very much, Dale, for that very gracious introduction. You should have on the screen our PowerPoint. Uh, our story in the book actually starts with Minnesota, but the PowerPoint will start with some background. Uh, and that is the civil rights background. What we see here are Mildred and Richard Loving the different race couple whose marriage was recognized by the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously in Loving versus Virginia. Uh, and very much inspired by the civil rights struggle, the early marriage plaintiffs, including uh, Jack uh, Baker and Mike McConnell, uh, felt that it was a civil right and not just a policy decision, their right to marry. The early cases were also brought against the backdrop of the women's rights movement, which vigorously criticized the enforcement of gender stereotypes and under Ruth Bader Ginsburg and other litigators was going to establish in the 70s sex as a quasi-suspect classification. Uh, as you know from Jack's book and our book, 1967, the loving year, is also the year that Jack proposed to Mike and Mike insisted, we're not going to be long-term partners, we're going to get married. And they became the first gay marriage celebrities. Uh, Jack was a student at the U of M Law School uh, and Mike was a recent graduate. They were the lawyers in the case. And they made in 71, 72, all of the arguments for marriage equality that ultimately were going to prevail as a constitutional matter. They said, well, we have a fundamental right to marry, just like the interracial couple did in Loving, as recognized by the Supreme Court in its alternative holding. It's also, they argued by analogy to Loving, a sex discrimination, which is also unconstitutional just like uh, different race marriages were denied because of the race of one partner, so same-sex marriages like Jack and Mike's were denied because of the sex of one partner. And then they also argued very much ahead of their time that sexual orientation was a suspect classification like race and sex. Now these arguments were not successful in the 1970s. All of the cases, including the first uh, federal case by Manonia Evans and Donna Burkett, and they were unsuccessful for the same reason. These claims, even to liberals and pro-gay progressives like Walter Mondale, were simply not intelligible as an interpretation of marriage, which they saw as definitionally and inherently one man and one woman. Uh, the era of AIDS in the 1980s uh, put a hiatus on the lawsuits, but they began again in the 90s. I represented the DC couple in the first lawsuit since the 70s suits, uh, and then there was also a very famous lawsuit mentioned by the dean in Hawaii. This is one of the plaintiff couples, Janora Dansel and Nania Bayer. That suit ultimately was not successful, defeated in 1998 by a popular referendum. 
And it did trigger, as the dean pointed out, a massive back backlash, supported very much by Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota passed a junior DOMA statute, and both Minnesota senators, Paul Wellstone and Rod Grahams, voted in favor of the Defense of Marriage Act, which was adopted by overwhelming majorities in the House and the Senate, and signed by adulterous President William Clinton in 1996. Uh, however, the beachhead was achieved shortly after DOMA, uh, and that was in Massachusetts. Mary Bonato is the lawyer there at the center, smiling. To the right of her is Annie Goodridge, who's the daughter of the lead plaintiff couple, Hillary and Julie Goodridge, who are to Annie's right. Uh, with the Massachusetts beachhead and marriage licenses actually being issued starting in May of 2004, the marriage map is not very colorful, I will admit. We have one marriage state, and then we have three states with Ruth Ginsburg called skim milk marriages. Uh, after years of litigation and uh, massive defeats at the polls in all but one state, Arizona actually defeated a marriage amendment in 2006. The marriage map did not look much different in November of 2008. Connecticut is added uh, in November of 2008 as a, as a marriage state, but there are a few more skim milk states, but not many. But here's the big take home point. Once marriage licenses are issued in Massachusetts starting in May of 2004, even though we're losing most of the cases and almost all of the referenda and initiatives, support for marriage equality ticks up about 2% each year after May of 2004, and opposition declines by about 2%. So that it's virtually tied in 2011, and then more people support marriage equality than not. And yet, we still continue to lose initiatives and referenda. And the most famous one was California's Prop 8. We had won marriage equality from the California Supreme Court in May of 2008 under the state constitution. But the opponents put on the ballot an amendment to the constitution called Prop 8, uh, managed by Frank Schubert, uh, the Mormons, and the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and they prevailed at the polls, even in gay-friendly California. That provoked a lot of reassessment of the marriage movement within the gayocracy. Uh, and leading empiricists, and I'm looking there at Thalia Zapatos, long time of the task force, Sean Lund of GLAAD, and Inika Mushevitz of MAP, uh, before and during the California campaign pointed out, with ordinary people, conflicted voters, that we need to win initiatives and referenda, rights-based arguments are not working. You need to appeal to the emotions and values of these voters with messages that demonstrate truthfully that lesbian and gay families, many of them raising children, have the same values and are very similar to their own families and that they ought to support this movement. At the same time that we're refining or developing new ideas about messaging, we're also refining and developing new ideas about grassroots mobilization. There are dozens of people involved. We've just put two on the, on the slide here, Sarah Reese and Amy Mello. Uh, Sarah uh, was with the task force and she and Dave Fleischer developed the concept of deep canvassing, not little neighborhood drop bys, but long and deep and personal conversations with neighbors who might be conflicted and open to persuasion. Amy Mello, who helped defend marriage equality in Massachusetts, was part of the 2012 campaign in Maine. I turn it over to Chris Riano, who helped orchestrate the victory in New York. Thanks so much, Bill. It's so exciting to be here. And I think one of the things that I'm really excited about kicking off with New York are a few items. First, as you can see from this slide, a theme that really does resonate throughout the 50-year marriage equality movement are the roles that people of color and women really have played when it comes to looking at equality. And so here you have Alfonso David, my former boss, as counsel to the governor, and you have Judith Kay, the former chief judge of the Court of Appeals here in New York, who both played an incredible role, Chief, uh, chief Judge Kay, writing the major dissent that, that came in the Hernandez case, where uh, you know, New York was forced to push marriage equality through the legislature. And Alfonso, who really took that and moved that ball forward, um, in 2011, when Governor Cuomo was elected, 
uh, which makes it really incredible. Now, obviously, he's the president of HRC. But this really only is one small piece. And if we go to our next slide, what we see is, of course, it's 2012. And finally, after that famous interview with Vice President Joe Biden, you know, oh, President Obama is forced to come out of the closet and come out for marriage equality. Now, I want to make a quick note. You know, New York's 2011, Obama's 2012. I think that shows how incredible Jack and Mike are for having pushed marriage equality decades and decades earlier in Minnesota. Um, we go to our next slide, and what we see is that even in 2012, even less than 10 years ago, marriage equality is in very few states. Civil unions are in very few states. This is a fight that continues to go on, and really, Minnesota takes center stage in these years, as the dean noted. So if we look at our next slide, you can see that in 2012, we really do have the initiatives and the referenda. Marriage equality lost every ballot campaign, except as Bill noted in Arizona in 26, uh, 2006, which was reversed in you know, 2008. You have the North Carolina question that comes up in early 2012. But really, Freedom to Marry and the Human Rights Campaign in Maine, Mich uh, Minnesota, Washington, and Maryland really start to push forward these referenda and initiatives. And it makes this message much more clear why straight people should support freedom to marry for all. And you see part of and many of the people who were involved in that. But really, and the next slide shows, one of the things that's so exciting is that Minnesota leads the way. Richard Carl Carlbaum, who is here with us today, and the team that supports freedom to marry to defeat the marriage amendment, November 2012 in Minnesota. It is a celebratory moment, moment just as the dean noted in his introduction. And you see marriage equality begin to sweep at the ballot box, which is a humongous change from the wins in courts and the legislature. You see it in Maine, Maryland, Washington. Obviously, Minnesota begins to move. And as the dean noted, you begin to have these questions that bounce around in the Minnesota legislature, just in time for the Supreme Court to really get involved. You have, obviously, 2013, Edie Windsor, you know, America's real, you know, uh, LGBTQ grandmother. She, out of New York City, sues, moves all the way up to the Supreme Court to invalidate the Defense of Marriage Act and wins. And as Scalia says in his dissent, that reasoning is going to begin to apply to state junior Defense of Marriage Acts as litigation continues. November 14, do we see this massive difference in just a few years of the number of states where marriage equality is the law of the land, which really begins to tee up, obviously, 2015. So uh, you see that exactly. And so obviously you have got Jim Obergefell, his husband, uh, John, here they are on the tarmac to get married in Maryland. They flew out of Ohio and be they begin this real march of litigation in the Sixth Circuit with a bunch of other plaintiffs. And what that does is it takes you all the way up to the Obergefell case at the Supreme Court where Justice Kennedy, again, similar to how he had done previously, finds when it comes to LGBTQ rights that there is a real core 14th Amendment liberty interest and an equal protection argument that surrounds why LGBTQ people have a fundamental right to marry after 50 years of incredible litigation and, and fighting. We, of course, trace in our work the DeBoer Rouse family, which is the family that came out of Michigan, these two nurses that worked at the hospitals that began to foster children and then adopt children who really did not want to get married at all. And the only reason they did fight for marriage equality is because the judge in their case said that they essentially had to in order to fight to be able to protect their family, which I think is an incredible point to look at in the marriage equality movement. This, of course, takes us to some overall lessons very briefly on the next slide. You know, humans change their minds based on emotion. And a lot has to come together for social justice movements to be successful. You have to have a group awareness of injustice, mobilization of dispersed members, publicized uh, and sh a show of ill treatment, and a number of unexpected messengers, which I think is something that we uh, talk a lot about in our book that we are, we're both excited to show, but also it's incredible to see how many messengers are, are required in order to really move a social justice movement forward. Another overall kind of lesson that comes together, um, you know, obviously is to celebrate Baker and McConnell who we're here to celebrate today. We're so excited to hear from them, but they really are the pioneers and we can see their 
hands in their rings on the next slide. Um, you know, in so many ways, they really are right at the forefront, which is what makes Minnesota so exciting. Some of our pioneers today, you can see uh, Donna Burkett, you can see Paul Barwick, uh, Janora and Catherine, her new spouse from Hawaii. And then obviously, uh, that is a picture that Bill and I took when we were interviewing April and Jane up in Michigan. Um, so the book is obviously out. I want to conclude with that. Um, we just published this from Yale Press and we're going to be around for questions. And I want to thank everybody for their time today as I round right into right on time, Dale. Perfect. Uh, I have the book. It's a wonderful book. I've just started reading it. It is uh, absolutely well worth your time. So thank you, Bill and Chris. I now want to turn, if I may, to, to Jack Baker and Mike McConnell. Um, and, and, and let me ask you, uh, Jack and, and Mike, um, you have the first and now the longest lasting same-sex marriage recognized in this country by any civil authority, or for that matter, in the world. Could you tell us a bit more about yourselves, uh, about your education, where you were born, your family background, and your professional background before we get into more questions? Jeff Dale, this is Michael, and uh, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, myself and Jack both. Um, I was born in Oklahoma, in Norman, Oklahoma, where the University of Oklahoma is. I come from a family um, that lived through the Dust Bowl of the Depression of those times. My older sister, two older sisters and older brother um, were kind of one family, and my younger sister and myself were kind of a second family for my parents. My father was a barber, my mother was a housewife, and um, I grew up in a very loving and supportive family. Um, my, uh, since I was in a university town and my father's business was actually literally right across the street from the University of Oklahoma, I uh, wound up going to the University of Oklahoma. I started in pharmacy and then uh, decided after four years in pharmacy, this was not the profession I wanted. I switched to library science and took my degree in uh, library science and then pursued a master's in library science and became a professional librarian after graduation uh, from that library school. I went to Kansas City where I worked at a small private college as a librarian and then uh, came to Minnesota when Jack came here to law school. Um, I, so I am uh, kind of the second part of, a, of my parents' family of five kids. Uh, Jack uh, grew up in Chicago. Both his parents passed away when he was quite young, four or five years old, uh, a year apart. He then uh, went to a Catholic boarding school in Des Plaines, which is suburban Chicago, where he was raised, and he graduated from high school there then went to ITT, Illinois Institute of Technology, for a time, and then from there to the University of Arizona and uh, joined the Air Force, got his engineering degree, and then uh, after he came out of the Air Force, he was at the University of, uh, well, actually, he was still in the Air Force, I guess, when he began studying his, uh, for his engineering degree at the University of Oklahoma, which is where I met him, he completed his engineering degree and uh, was working on a master's degree in business administration when we met. And after meeting, um, he then decided he was going to pursue a law degree, and that's how we wound up in Minnesota. Great. Well, can, can you can you t tell us a bit more about your relationship? How and and where uh, and when did you meet? And at what point did you decide to? get married? Uh, yes. Uh, we met through a mutual friend. Um, during those years, this was the early 60s, uh, gay society in Oklahoma was very closeted, but in the, at the University of Oklahoma, there was a large contingency of gay people and um, there were private parties and other kinds of events that people would go to. There were gay bars in Oklahoma City that were very secretive and often raided. 
Uh, but uh, this friend, this mutual friend who introduced us, asked me to go with him to a Halloween party in Octo on October 29, 1966. Uh, his name was Cruz Sanchez. And Cruz was kind of a matchmaker for gay people during those times. At this party, he said, Michael, I want you to come over here. I have someone I want you to meet. And I thought, oh no, here he goes again. He's gonna try to match me up with someone. And uh, he introduced me to Jack. And I think um, after I met Jack, we just exchanged pleasantries and continued to interact with the rest of the party. And uh, I pulled Cruz aside and I said, what are you up to? And he said, you don't know, Michael, but you two are destined for each other. And Evidently, he was right. Um, I think that's true. We began to date, and um, the following year, in March 1967, Jack proposed to me on his birthday, and I had been not sure about uh, wanting to get tied down with someone, so I kind of thought, okay, I think I'll do something to delay him until I can finish my degree and be fully independent and have a job. So I said, okay, what I want you to do is, if I'm going to commit to you, you have to find a way for us to get legally married. And there was this very sharp little point of silence. And then he said, well, looks like I'm going to have to go to law school. And at that point, we committed. So that's what we kind of call our commitment anniversary. That's now 54 years. And um, that's how we decided we were going to be married. I did that because marriage was very important in my family. Uh, all of my siblings, my cousins, my aunts and uncles, all were in long-term committed marriages. And this is what I wanted for myself. All right. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your involvement in gay rights advocacy in the late 1960s and early 1970s at the University of Minnesota? Yeah, I, and this is Jack. I, uh, in, the, in the late 60s, I had taken a job as an engineer with DuPont, and we were um, it's just outside of, uh, of, of, of uh, Lawrence, Kansas. And at the time, we were living in Lawrence, Kansas, and that's when we first got involved because there was a demonstration because some uh, there was a black uh, employee who got uh, was fired somehow, and I don't really remember all the details, but there was a large demonstration, and we took part in that. And once we took part in that demonstration, we decided that we were going to get involved and do more of it, except that we were going to uh, uh, we were going to take it up from a from the gay standpoint when I got to the to the law school and and when and I, I applied for several different law law schools and uh, uh, we Mike wanted uh, uh, wanted to go to the University of Minnesota because it was the northernmost one and the coolest one, uh, cool from the temperature standpoint. And so that's what got us involved. At that point, I was determined I was going to start a, a gay rights organization. There was one already starting there, um, and 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 so uh, I took out, uh, got actively involved in that. Uh, I was elected to be its president. It was called Free, and uh, we we were a very active group. And uh, we were determined. Our our our, 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 our we just, we were determined that we would be full and absolute equality, no exceptions, no excuses, and that we would we 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 would not take no for an answer. And uh, that was, uh, and eventually uh, I was elected student body president and we just kept pushing. And while I was in law school, one of the things that I had learned was that the marriage statute, by doing some research at the law library, 
Well, the marriage statute did not forbid persons of the same sex to get married. It had a lot. Of, it had a list of those who could not get married, but was so what was not included in the list was persons of the same sex. So I told Mike, this was going to be a slam dunk. All we have to do is go down to the courthouse and apply for a marriage license. Um, and that's what got us going. And uh, everybody objected. I mean, the, the, the law school, the, 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 the Board of Regents was upset. Um, the dean of the law school was upset. Uh, everybody was upset, but nevertheless, we did it, and uh, we decided that once we applied, we were going to take it all the way, and and we would not say no for uh, uh, we would not stop. We went all the way to the Supreme Court and back, and kept on fighting, and then we're still fighting. Forty-seven years later, we're still at it. Right. Let, let me, I'm sure, uh, so that leads to my next question. I mean, I'm sure, by the way, parenthetically, Dean Jenkins will be delighted to hear that he should use Minnesota's northern location as a recruitment tool for students in the future. But let me ask you this sort of related, you know, this was a time when sodomy was banned in just about every state in the country, including in Minnesota. There were bans on military service by gay people. Uh, there were no laws protecting gay people from discrimination in employment, to be fired from federal employment. There were bans on immigration. I mean, the legal environment was not very friendly at all. So really, what made you think, aside from just reading the statute, which is interesting in itself, what made you think that marriage was even an option? And, and then the related question for you is, why was it important for you to have that particular legal status? Well, this is Michael again. Um, the reason, of course, that we thought civil marriage was an option was, as Jack said, the statute said so. And quite frankly, my family had always told me as a young man, um, we may come from a poor background, but we're as good as anyone else and we're entitled to the same rights, and all we have to do is stand up for ourselves and work for what we believe in, and we will get there. And I believed that. Those are the principles that I lived by. Uh, I think what Jack said a little earlier, full and absolute equality, uh, no exceptions, no excuses, has been the bedrock of our thinking for many, many years, certainly all of our life together which is now 54 years. So um, I think that comes from the bedrock of my family's belief, but I also uh, think that they just don't understand how determined Jack is and how determined I am. We believe under the Constitution that we have rights. And if any other couple gets to exercise those rights, we get to exercise those rights as well. Uh, why was it important to have the legal status? Well, there, there are those personal reasons, um, as I stated, in our family, that was what you did. You got married and you raised your family and interacted with everyone and became an important part of the community. Um, that was extremely port important to us. But beyond that, um, there are legal reasons. There are over a thousand federal benefits that, that come from marriage and in our state over 500. And we believe that if a, an opposite sex couple has the, the right of those benefits, we have the same right. And so that is why we uh, continue to fight for this right. And so you, you actually succeeded in getting a rural county in Minnesota, Blue Earth County, to issue you a marriage license in August of 1971. But, but Hennepin County, in Min which is Minneapolis County, rejected your marriage application. And then the Hennepin case reached the Minnesota Supreme Court and ultimately reached the United States Supreme Court, which dismissed your 
claim for want of a substantial federal question without more explanation. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that sequence of events and also what were the arguments you made and who represented you? Well, this is Jack again. We were represented by the Minnesota Supreme, uh, Minnesota Civil Liberties Union. The, uh, the ACLU of New York refused to get involved because they took the position that uh, uh, same-sex marriage was not a civil liberties issue. Um, but nevertheless, in, in the, the arguments we made were that, first of all, the First Amendment, there's a freedom of speech and, and association. The Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution forbids cruel and unusual punishment, but to, to deny same-sex same couples the same rights that uh, opposite-sex couples have. And the Ninth Amendment, unequal uh, 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 an enumerated right to privacy. And then the 14th Amendment, which the fundamental rights to marry. Um, but the, 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 what the, the Minnesota Supreme Court did, it, if you look very closely, they didn't issue a ruling. They issued an opinion. It's clearly identical. Federal Supreme Court. Minnes what? Federal Supreme Court not Minnes Minnes they issued an opinion. It's clearly identified as an opinion because they knew that the, the, the state statute did not forbid uh, persons of the same sex to get, to get a marriage license. And so in their ruling, in their opinion, they said that the clerks of court can therefore, even though the state law doesn't forbid uh, marriage between persons of the same sex, clerks of the district courts can arbitrarily just refuse to give it because that won't offend the U.S. Constitution. That was their opinion. And, and, and uh, so we appealed that to the, to the U.S. Supreme Court because under the rules at the time, uh, a, a ruling by a state court uh, is, you know, it can have a direct uh, appeal to the a direct uh, appeal right to the to the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court did, did dismiss it for want of a substantial federal question. But the real reason they dismissed it was because it was mute. The 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 county attorney uh, had gotten a uh, uh, hired one of the law professors. Uh, who was a teacher on um, 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 marriage, and he wrote the opinion for the for the for the for the county attorney, and he he said that the the the, the, the they had already been issued a license in in uh, Blue Earth County, and therefore the 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 the, the, the uh, case was mute, um, and it turns out he was right. Uh, we later, it took us 40 something years to prove it, but we ultimately proved, got a, a, the, the, a ruling by the district court in Blue Earth County to ultimately agree that the license that was issued was in fact legal and has never been overruled. And so therefore the, the, uh, uh, what, what the, what the, County attorney had argued in the U.S. Supreme Court uh, was in fact correct, and 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 that's the reason, in my opinion, why the court dismissed it for want of a substantial federal question, not because they wanted, not because they had taken a look at any of the issues. They really didn't want to do it at that time, but they're also. The, we already had a license, and I knew we had a license. I knew that the, the, we had a marriage license. I mean, we had a valid license before we did the appeal. But we we allowed in the Minnesota Civil Liberties Union to to go forward with the U.S. to the U.S. Supreme Court just as a backup in case we ultimately did not prevail in the state court. It turns out. We didn't prevail in the U.S. Supreme Court, but we did prevail in the state court, ultimately. Yeah, so, so let me ask you just briefly about that. So after the Obergefell decision came down in 2015, um, the state district court in Minnesota 
declared that your marriage in Blue Earth County, as you mentioned, uh, had been valid all along. And yes. this is just two years ago. And so, in fact, they said that, the, that the, your marriage had never been declared void or had, had never been annulled. And so it was in effect all along. Can you, can you tell us why you sought that declaration from the uh, district court in Minnesota? Well, the real reason was that uh, we had we had we had the the certificate that was signed by the pastor who uh, who uh, was at at the at the ceremony, um, and we took that 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 was uh, uh, we took that as as, as, as as we took thought that that was good enough. But it turns out that that was really just dressing that uh, that the, the the counties give you that you can post on the wall. It had no legal value, no merit whatsoever. I had assumed that we could turn that into the to the Social Security, and they would accept it. As it turns out, they did not. When, so at the time when we when we when I decided to apply for spousal benefits. That's when we found out that the the the, uh, the 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 certificate that we had been issued at the ceremony, they would not accept, and they were the ones who were insisting that we get something certified by the county or by the state, and that's why we then had to proceed to to start all over again and go into court, and and proved that the that the, the 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 license that we had was in fact valid it was basically the, the social security that required us to do that i understand well i just want to thank you jack and mike for talking with us today i'm i'm sure some people have questions for you that we will uh we will try to address at the end but i i want to thank you for talking with us today and i think i speak for millions of people across this country when I also want to thank you for the courage that you've exhibited over more than the past half century. So let me turn it over now, if I might, to Gail, who is going to discuss the book that you have written. Uh, so Gail, welcome. Well, thank you. I'm very glad to be here. And I'm going to be really low tech and show you the book in my hands rather than put it on a screen because I thought that would be kind of refreshing and also easier for me. But there's the book on the screen. See that? Somebody knows how to do all these things. So what the book originally looked like in its hardcover edition was this sort of powder blue wedding cake. And now it's come out in a new paperback edition that you see right there on the screen. And it's got the final chapter or epilogue which contains the story of that last lawsuit so that Jack and Michael were able to be validated by the Social Security Administration, which means that an arm of the federal government has now acknowledged that they married in 1971, making them the world's first legally valid gay marriage, which is pretty big news. So let me tell you just a little bit about writing the book because it was an amazing experience. We decided when, when Jack and Michael invited me to, to write the book, they invited me by the way, because we knew each other in Minnesota when I was a graduate student in English and I worked for Jack at his student corporation. Uh, 40 something years later, they called me up because they wondered if I was still writing and I was, I was mostly writing for children and asked me if, if I would tell their story with them. And we decided together that the way to tell this story was to make it a book that anybody could access. So I think of it as both a love story and a law story, but it's written in lay language. So you can understand the legal thinking and the steps that they went through without being a lawyer. And um, that was a challenge for me because I am certainly not a lawyer. But it was an interesting experience to write it and try to capture their voices, in particular Michael's voice, 
as they went from being ordinary people to become legends in their own time. Now, the book's not a biography. It begins with their love story and then kind of flashes back to their past and then brings you forward as they go through the steps that they had to take in order to validate this marriage. So it's the story of a vision that they had to be legally married in the eyes of everybody way back before people even considered, most people considered this a possibility and how they persevered in their vision over a lifetime. It's now been nearly half a century and they have just recently gotten validation from the American, well, the Social Security Administration, the American government, that their marriage was indeed legal, that they are fully equal under the law. So I think that's pretty incredible to read a story that has such a marvelous ending and involved so much perseverance along the way. Uh, in the end, I guess the main motif of the book is that love wins. And that's the message that Jack and Michael really wanted me to convey in the story, that in the end, love wins. It might take some time. You got to give it time. But in the end, love always prevails under the law. Well, thank you, Gail. That is a great uh, segue into our next segment. And I'm sure, by the way, that uh, people will want to pick up your book, The Marriage Heard Around the World, which tells this story. I know that I'm going to make, make a point of getting it because I do want to hear, um, hear about it. So uh, I want to turn it over now, uh, lastly, but not leastly, to my friends, uh, Richard and Christine. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks for having us. Great to have you. Um, in 2011, as you know, the Minnesota legislature placed a state constitutional amendment on the ballot to appear in November of 2012 to limit the definition of marriage in the state constitution to one man and one woman. So first, can you each tell us a bit about your background and how you became involved in the campaign against that, uh, that amendment and what your role was. Uh, Richard, Christine, whoever wants to start. Go ahead, Christine. Um, so my work on this issue actually started in 2004. And it started because at the time I was the chief of staff at the Minnesota Senate. And there was a new freshman state senator whose name is Michelle Bachman. Um, you've probably heard of her or remember her. She's disappeared a little bit now, which isn't a bad thing necessarily, but I digress. Um, she came into the state Senate with a vengeance um, and a lot of ambition. As you saw, she went on to be a um, congressional representative from Minnesota, very um, religious conservative person who um, came into the Minnesota Senate like she owned it and said, we are doing the Defense of Marriage Act. And before we knew it, um, she had hundreds of people in the halls of the state capitol with Bibles and children and chanting and prayer and rallies um, going on and on about one man and one woman. Um, the Democrats in the Senate in the two plus year period of time that I was there um, blocked that from passing and going on the ballot. And that was my entree into the issue. After that, fast forward, um, you know, that went on 2004, 2005, 2006. Fast forward five years, the Senate um, goes Republican into Republican control and the um, legislature goes ahead and puts on the ballot this amendment. On the one hand, you know, that was devastating. On the other hand, they did it um, about 18 months prior to the election where people would be voting on the question. And that was actually a gift because it gave us, it gave our side 18 months to get ourselves together and to organize ourselves. Um, and so I started right away in May of 2011, working on um, doing some of that organizing work, trying to build the coalition uh, that would eventually become the campaign, searching, doing a professional search for a campaign manager, and then um, organizing a board of very disparate people who 
um, some of whom agreed on absolutely nothing with each other except for this question. Um, it was a large and sort of unruly board as these things are want to be, um, but that was sort of the strength of it at the same time. And so that's how I got involved. All right, Christine, thank you very much. Richard, real quick, and then I'm gonna get into another question for you. Sure, absolutely. First, let me say that it's an honor to be on this panel with Jack and Mike and so many other folks. Uh, Christine and I are just deeply honored that you invited us to be here. Um, my story is that on May 11th, 2011, my husband, my now husband, my partner of eight years uh, got down on one knee and asked me to marry him. And about a week later, we were in the uh, state capitol um, the night before the legislative session ended when the legislature put this question before the voters. And it was uh, a devastating experience, the electricity inside the Capitol that night uh, with activists uh, chanting shame at, at lawmakers who put this on the ballot, really emotional speeches by both sides of the aisle, um, incredible speeches by two Republicans um, that, that come to mind in particular, um, knowing and, and leaving there that night, just knowing that we had to do something. Um, at the time, I had just got done working for then Congressman Tim Walls, now our governor, and as this uh, communications director for the city of St. Paul. Uh, and uh, some folks approached me and asked me if I'd be interested in applying for the job. Uh, I, I applied, went through three rounds of very vigorous interviews, uh, petrified experience with uh, Christine and Dale, uh, the tip of the spear. <laughs> That's okay. We, we forgive your pooch. Um, and ultimately, you know, um, was very honored to be selected uh, to lead the, to be the campaign manager for Minnesota United for All, for All Families. I do want to say that Christine was the board chair, Dale the, the treasurer, and John Sullivan, um, a local gay rights advocate and activist here in the Twin Cities, was the secretary. And if not for the three of them, uh, this thing would, would have never gotten off the ground, would have never been successful. Uh, so want to really uh, thank you for all the work you all did as well. Well, uh, thank you for that. Um, Richard and Christine, in the prior 30 campaigns around same-sex marriage, same-sex marriage advocates had lost every single time. And now there's an asterisk, I think, around the Arizona campaign, but for the most part, I think it's fair to say we'd lost every single time. What, um, what went into your strategy to make sure that we didn't lose again? Well, I think there are three things that come to mind right away. First off, Christine already mentioned this. Um, they gave us 18 months and that was 18 months to build a broad and robust coalition of disparate voices and organizations that um, were re ready to stand up and say no. Uh, I got the vote no sign behind me actually. Um, uh, and encourage Minnesotans to vote no on the question itself. Uh, two, uh, it was covered by Bill earlier, Bill and Christopher earlier, but you know, the work that Thalia Zapatos led nationally to uh, unlock the secret behind how to talk about marriage uh, in terms of it being about uh, love, family, and commitment, um, and the freedom to marry, and not just rights and benefits was really critical. I think that's why uh, we won four ballot initiatives in November of, of 2012. Uh, and then the last thing is, you know, it's the early leadership that emerged um, there were groups like the Kevin, Mo Kevin Mosier Foundation here in Minnesota that's closely aligned with the University of Minnesota and others who stepped up very early and ensured that uh, Minnesota would have the resources it needed to build a campaign early. And Christine, I'm sure you could tell stories about how we started spending money and hiring people from day one, and it kind of shocked people a little bit. Yeah, I would say that the other really hard part um, early on, and this sort of remained throughout the effort, was um, number one, making sure that the LGBT groups in Minnesota were able to maintain a kind of a leadership role and maintain their own identities. One of the things that we had heard from other states, um, from leaders of nonprofits in other states, was that they sort of lost their group's identity and lost their group's energy and, and donors to a certain extent because all the energy and money got sucked into a, a marriage amendment campaign. And we were pretty determined to make sure that didn't happen to ours. That was a big kind of lesson learned that we took from other states. The other thing I'd say is that as for as hard work as it was to win the effort, it was as hard of work uh, doing the care and feeding of our own supporters. 
many of whom were um, honestly just deeply afraid and skeptical that it could be done and bringing along and, and trying to keep hope in our own people, in our own supporters was a really hard thing. People had trouble. Um, they didn't want to believe the research. They, everyone was uncertain, like, are we doing it right? I don't believe this polling. This doesn't ring true to me in my gut. I'm not sure how I feel about this. I don't know if I can support this campaign if I don't feel like I'm sure that you know what you're doing and this is the right path. And we just really, um, Richard did an, a, an amazing job of um, having everybody hold hands and sort of step off the cliff together um, to have faith in the research that we had and uh, the lessons we had learned from other states. That was a really big part of the work. Richard, do you want to add anything? No, I think that's that's a good summation. Okay, well, great. I have to tell you, I have to confess, and I think both both of you know this, I was one of the skeptics. I was one of the people who was deeply skeptical of the idea that we were gonna we were pursuing the right strategy. But even if I was thought we were pursuing the right strategy, I still thought we were probably going to lose. But I want to share with you a video from the night of the election. Um, so I'm gonna play this, this video of Richard speaking to a room full of, I would say about 200 campaign volunteers, give or take, including by the way, me and my now husband. Um, on the night of the election, it was about 1.45 a.m. Um, and I want you to, as, as the video begins, so Richard is speaking to this group, as the video begins, the outcome of this election was still uncertain, but we still didn't know we were going to win. And you'll notice that Richard occasionally looks off to the side to one of the campaign volunteers to hear from that worker as she was constantly refreshing her cell phone to see if an official result had been announced, but we still didn't know whether or not we'd won. And you'll see at one point she interrupts him and uh, gives him the result and you'll, you'll see what the reaction is. I do wanna warn you, um, especially those of you with tender ears, if there are any, that Richard does drop an F-bomb early on in his speech in all of the enthusiasm, I never heard him do it before or since, but early on in his speech, uh, <laughs> caught up in, in the moment. Now, watch the reaction as on live video, we get the result from this campaign. It's very brief, uh, very brief video. You know, the last seven days, because some of you all have joined us just recently, in the last seven days, we have fucking called 900,000 <laughs> We have knocked on over 400,000 doors in the last seven days. in Minnesota history had something like 11,800 volunteers. <laughs> this week we had 27,000. <laughs> I defied you, I defy you, whatever your position was, not to feel the joy that was in the room that night. 
my husband actually recorded the video that you just saw on his cell phone. Uh, and the longer video, if you want to see it, is available on YouTube. It's called The Moment of Victory in Minnesota. Uh, and so I encourage you to do that. But Richard and Christine, as joyful as that night was, and it was joyful, um, same-sex couples still could not legally get married in the state of Minnesota. So the law had to be changed, and you were both leaders in that effort. How did you go about accomplishing that objective? And specifically, what do you believe were the differences between the ballot campaign on the one hand and the legislative campaign on the other? Go ahead, Richard. Well, so the, the legislative campaign was different in, this, in the sense that instead of uh, trying to use our massive grassroots effort to talk to as many voters as possible and spark as many conversations as we could, we had to redirect that energy um, to ensure that people knew that they had an audience of one and it was whoever represented them in the state legislature. And so there's a lot of uh, maneuvering that happens behind the scenes but the biggest challenge that I had as a campaign manager was ensuring that people understood the, the conversations that they've been having for 18 months now needed to shift and uh, legislators needed to hear from those who they represented. Uh, in 2013, uh, it was a budget year in Minnesota. The governor uh, in the legislature was, in, was a, of a single party for the first time uh, in my memory, maybe in my lifetime, it was a very long time. And so there was a lot of pent up energy around a lot of progressive issues. Um, and we had to figure out how to best transition the energy momentum from a, legend, from a ballot fight into a legislative fight. Uh, and so we very quickly uh, brought on and had Christine again, build the core team from the beginning of um, you know, strategic thinkers, lobbyists at the Capitol. Uh, I think our lobbying team grew to be 16 members at one point, we had several legal advisors, Dale kind of leading them uh, with HRC um, in, in the state. Uh, and it took, you know, it took about five and a half months, uh, but we got it done. I will say that there are a lot of people early who looked at us and said, you know, let's wait a year. Let's maybe wait a year. You know, it was a close one. Let's not move too quickly. Uh, but from the beginning, Christine and I and Scott Dibble and others were pretty sure that you couldn't waste the energy and momentum of that moment um, and, and wait a year. You had to try and figure out how to move it quickly. Um, and we did so in a way because of Christine's great counsel that wasn't like on the first day demanding immediate passage of a law, uh, but instead we made it very clear to legislative leaders we were going to be strategic and thoughtful, uh, but very much focused on passing it in that first legislative session in 2013. Yeah, I would say that's a that's a great encapsulation of how it went. Um, it was definitely a shift, and there, um, the time period from winning the ballot measure to really getting a legislative effort going was, like Richard said, a period of time where people said, "Hey, wait a minute, just because a person voted no on putting." language related to one man and one woman equating marriage into the Constitution, that doesn't mean they support same-sex marriage. Those are sort of two different things. And our answer was, okay, maybe for some people, but we, you know, we have like, don't limit the freedom to marry on every sign, bumper sticker, ad, everywhere we could put it. It's not like we were playing hide the ball with what we were about by any stretch of the imagination. And so, um, you know, there, there again, I think that took an element of bravery because there were people who were afraid, you know, is it too soon? Are we, what if we do it and fail? We just had this great victory. Why can't we just sit in the victory chair for a while and not push ahead? It's too much too fast. Um, but given the electoral lineup, and I mean, I tell you, elect, talk about elections mattering, this would not have happened, but for the fact that that election turned out the way it did, um, we never would have gotten there. It, it is The election result is what enabled us to get there. And then we were coming off of having all this great organizing work that Richard and the team had done um, to put us in a position to be successful. So we went for it and it, it was, you know, it's fun to win. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Uh, well, well, thank you, Richard and Christine, uh, both for your presentations today and for your incredible leadership during this, uh, this time. Amazing, amazing work. Thank um, you. Minnesota misses you. Uh, I miss it too. Yeah, come um, home, Bill. Uh, I, we're going to turn it now over to questions, your questions from the audience. Uh, and we have about 15 minutes or so to do that. So I'm going to, I've got a couple of questions in the queue. If you have one, let me know. But there's a, a question I want to direct, if I may, to Chris and Bill. This is from Carol Chomsky. Um, she writes, she asks, basically asks about the future of same-sex marriage rather than the past. So she says, with the recent questioning of the protections for LGBTQ individuals raised by two Supreme Court justices and the likely confirmation of Judge Barrett, how at risk do you think our progress on marriage and other equality is? And she notes, I worry about regressing on the law, but wonder whether the advances in practice and understanding will help carry the day. So that's the question for Chris and Bill. Chris, you want to start? You know, I, I think I'll say this, and then I'll, I know, Bill, you've been talking about this frequently, but I think Bill and I both agree, you know, there's an incredible, you know, importance that comes with both this election and then obviously this question about the Supreme Court. Um, if you look in the bigger scheme of things, you know, I think Bill mentioned this before, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg talking about skim milk marriages, and there is a real risk that, even though marriage equality is now supposedly the law of the land, there could be a real degradation when it comes to some of the really important pieces that come with marriage recognition, family recognition. There's a massive case on the docket next term, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, that deals very specifically with questions about religious uh, freedom under the First Amendment and anti-discrimination statutes and how those may be in conflict. And those questions could have a real serious impact when it comes to the word I'll use is equality, meaning are LGBTQ marriages actually equal and recognized as being equal under the law? So I actually think that's a really critical question because the idea that obviously is in Obergefell is that there should be this equality. There have been some questions about that with recognition, but there is absolutely a question and risk that comes when it comes to the Supreme Court and its members, especially when you have two that are openly questioning the case from five years ago, um, how marriage will look and whether those marriages that we have for LGBTQ people in certain states could actually look very differently. And this idea of milk, kind of like, you know, skim milk marriage could actually become a reality. And so I think it's actually a very important thing to be talking about um, and an important thing to be conscious of, right, Bill? The stakes could not be higher. There are now only three justices on the Supreme Court who believe that Obergefell was correctly decided. And one of those justices is uh, very old. So this election will determine the fate of Obergefell, which is shaky even if Joe Biden is elected. So uh, as Chris is saying, uh, Obergefell is in play. Will it be overruled? Not necessarily overruled, but it will be hollowed out uh, under certain configurations of the court. And very specifically, the Fulton case is being billed incorrectly as a case just about religious allowances. It is about that. Catholic Services is asking for an allowance for it to discriminate uh, against LGBT married couples based upon religious faith. But this is not a private program. The Philadelphia program for foster children is a government program the government is responsible in the state of Pennsylvania for children that are abandoned or that it is taken from their homes. It is responsible as the government for these foster children. And Catholic Services is a state contracting agency that is paid to be part of that program. So what a majority of the court probably would like to rule would be virtually unprecedented in American history. 
where a state program is authorized to discriminate against legal and constitutionally protected marriages if the challenge is successful uh, at some level. Uh, so that would begin a hollowing out process uh, uh, for Obergefell, and it would be either a gesture or maybe an open statement that same-sex marriages are not going to be treated the same as different sex marriages under many circumstances by the state. And then that's in addition to all of the many private lawsuits that are being brought and that it will be brought uh, in private situations where free exercise clause claims or RIFRA claims are going to be made to create allowances for private groups uh, to uh, follow their faith traditions rather than the norms of the anti-discrimination laws. So yes, this is a very big deal. Uh, and the point of our book, and I think the point of Mike and Jack's book, is that marriage equality was a normative moral movement that persuaded most Americans, remember my graph, it's now a large majority of Americans, straight Americans, all sorts of Americans, that it is a good thing that committed lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, queer couples, many of them raising children, can have their relationships validated as marriage, civil marriage on the same terms that everybody else has. And what we argue in the book is that was always good for America and not just good for LGBTQ people. That's our pitch. Thank you. Um, Jack and Mike, if you're still there, I do have a question for you specifically. Um, what battles do you see on the horizon for LGBT people? Well, all of this, this is Michael, all of this depends on, as was just stated earlier, the vote this fall. Um, I think we are really talking about full and absolute equality, that bedrock we have always stood on, and we cannot really achieve that uh, as citizens until we have um, influence in the power in this country, the White House, the Senate, and the legislature, and the courts. And that means that our work is not even close to being over. We have got a lot of work to do still. We need to pass um, equality legislation through the Congress and uh, we still have lots of work at the local state levels to accomplish. Um, I think that the fight for the, um, against the marriage amendment here in this state and subsequently passing marriage into law in this state are perfect examples of what we face uh, for our basic rights. And that is extremely important. I think that what Jack and I did with regard to Social Security is something that older gays are going to face uh, as, as more and more people come to understand that these rights that we are given uh, through marriage and for who we are just as citizens uh, are at risk when we go to Social Security or any other agency to claim those rights. So we have a lot to do. My, my view on this is that time does not go backwards. If you look at where we were and where we are, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very long distance. And so, yeah, we may go back a, a few steps, but uh, two steps backward and three forward. Um, that's my view. I, 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 I don't see the sky falling. Um, it's, 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 it's not a perfect world, but uh, it's, I don't think it's going to go in reverse completely. Uh, Richard and Christine, do you have anything to add to that on the challenges ahead for LGBTQ people? I would, I, I would add that um, we know that there's a lot of um, discrimination in public housing or in, in housing and, and in private employment. That is a great concern and we need to um, continue to expand rights for um, the our transgender brothers and sisters who um, are disproportionately impacted uh, by that 
You're muted, Christy. Sorry. Anything um, else? Yeah, that in this, uh, just specific to this particular election cycle, I am aware of a number of different entities that have done polling on a number of these issues and, and also polling on conversion therapy. And um, th there are significant numbers of people who oppose conversion therapy once it is clearly explained to them when you do polling. Um, and it is a, um, there is an undercurrent of it there. If there were to be a certain group of people were to get control of legislative bodies, I think that, that would be, that would become a thing. There are also some of these other um, issues that have been talked about here. So I just add that one in the mix because I'm aware of some recent polling that's been done on it and how that turned out. Right. Okay. Um, I think we just have, we have one other question in the queue. So if you have questions you'd like to ask, just use the Q and A format, the feature at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar and, and just uh, address that question. I'll be happy to, uh, to point uh, the question to one of the speakers. There's another question sort of related, I think, to the earlier question about uh, from Bill, for, for Bill and Chris about uh, the dangers ahead potentially for same-sex marriages. I think this questioner wants to know whether there's anything in particular to fear from the concurring opinion uh, re or the statement recently issued by Justices Thomas and Alito complaining about the religious liberty implications of Obergefell and how they would might want the court to address that in the future. So are there implications here in that opinion for the possibility of tearing away at Obergefell? Uh, well, the, the, the first thing to mention would be something positive. Uh, it was issued when the court was rejecting 9-0, the petition of Kim Davis, the Kentucky clerk, an, an official who refused to give people marriage licenses that they were constitutionally entitled to. So there were no votes on the court, to our knowledge, for the court to intervene to protect public officials who were refusing to obey the law. Now, I realize that's a low bar, but that is cause for some kind of notice. Uh, clearly, what Justices Thomas and Alito, and I think as many as three other justices, maybe four other justices, are signaling uh, is that uh, Obergefell is first going to be hollowed out. You carve out exceptions. And I think it was a shot across the bow in the Fulton case, the Philadelphia case, that these justices and as many as four other justices are going to vote to create a state discrimination in Philadelphia against same-sex marriages. Now, that doesn't mean they'll all go through with that but it does mean that's actively being considered within the U.S. Supreme Court. And that's in addition to other religious allowances. And we think there is a place for religious allowances. Our book talks very favorably about the Utah Statute of Principles in 2015, which created a new anti-discrimination law, as well as recognizing some principal religious allowances. But what the uh, Justices Alito and Thomas are signaling is something much broader, something much more partisan, a direct attack on the Equal Protection Clause, and a direct attack on what the Supreme Court, since Loving versus Virginia, to go back to that far, has repeatedly said about the fundamental right to marry. So yeah, this is really big. And Bill, and maybe, maybe Chris, Chris, did you want to add something to that? I just wanted to add something about Fulton. For all of the remedies nerds who may be watching today, I wrote about this in the brief that I worked on for the New York State Bar Association in Fulton. One of the things that I found shocking about Fulton is actually the request for an injunction. They've requested an injunction to order the city to allow discrimination in their contract. And I find that to be an extraordinary request for remedy. It's a very unique thing if you look historically at how these cases have looked. And it goes much further in some ways than a lot of the cases about LGBTQ equality. I think that's another reason why, as Bill noted, Fulton is a critical case. I know a lot of people have their eyes on it. I would just suggest that people take a double look again, because this case could really become a very unique change to the Smith 
uh, holding that was written by Justice Scalia and the way we've looked at religious freedom. And, and as Bill noted, you know, we talk a lot in the book about the attempt to, to balance religious freedom and LGBTQ rights and ways to do that appropriately. Um, but what Fulton is really looking at, what Fulton could represent is a rather magnificent shift away from the way the court has been going for many years. And a huge power grab by the US Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. If they get five justices to sign on to the Alito and Thomas view, which I think will remain in play. By the way, um, um, Actually, we have a last question. I'll, I'll, a last question here from uh, my former colleague, Bill McGovern. He asks, how can the deep conversations political model pioneered in this movement, the same-sex marriage movement, and particularly in the Minnesota amendment campaign that R Richard and Christine helped shepherd through, help influence our strategy going forward? Richard and Christine, do you think there's something in particular in the, in the model that you helped to apply successfully going forward? The deep yeah. conversations model? Yeah, the, yeah we, we call it now deep canvassing. So in the world of political organizing, it's become uh, kind of titled deep canvassing and it's being used. Um, it's being used by the Biden campaign. Uh, actually, you know, this past weekend in Minnesota, believe it or not, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, the Biden campaign started pioneering uh, or piloting, excuse me, um, a deep canvassing uh, effort here in Minnesota, going door to door, um, staying 10 to 15 feet away from the door once somebody answers it. But the whole idea here is that you invite people into a conversation um, and you allow them uh, to, you know, be comfortable with who they are and what they believe, um, sharing no judgment of uh, or, or influence on, on how they are currently looking at, at a situation. And instead you invite them into a conversation usually centered around shared values um, that you can agree upon, even if you don't agree on the particular question. Uh, and so I, what I would say is that we've seen it used this uh, campaign cycle, even in, in the midst of this pandemic, uh, both going door to door and on the phones. Uh, people, believe it or not, at home have been answering uh, the, the phone a lot more this cycle than in previous election cycles. Um, and what the biggest change is that, you know, if you volunteered for a campaign six years ago, you would have been handed a script that lasts about 20 seconds. Uh, your, your goal was to ascertain a couple of bits of information that you could put down onto the call sheet and then you'd move on and you try to make as many of those conversations in a one hour or two hour block as possible. And with deep canvassing, you're not measured on the number of conversations you have, but you're measured on the quality of conversation you have. And if you can invite somebody to look at an issue, a candidate uh, or a decision from a different point of view, um, that's your ultimate goal uh, in that deep canvassing conversation. So not only is it being used by uh, candidates, but also, for example, Moms to Men Action and Every Time for Gun Safety have been using it nationally since about 2014. Christine, would, anything to add? Yeah, I would just add that um, it's a great question and I'm, I'm glad people think about it because uh, on the one hand, it's never been harder to do that kind of organizing where you have the conversation because of how polarized the electorate is right now. I would also add that it's never been more needed. It is more needed now than ever, ever before because people of at least, you know, Minnesotans are not known for their being forthright. Um, so, you know, it's not that they're dishonest, it's that they don't wanna share because they don't wanna offend anybody. Um, and, and so, it's really hard to sort of draw that out of people, but it is more important than ever right now, given the polarization, to try to find that place where you can have the shared values conversation that Richard referenced. Wise words. Um, and uh, I think we're going to conclude with the questions that there was one more question from my former colleague, Heidi Katrasser, who says that she would like to hear more from my dog. But I can tell you my dog was only responding to the dog whistle from Alito and Thomas, so he doesn't have anything more to say about it. Thank you uh, for your questions and for joining us for today's webinar discussion on marriage equality in the United States and particularly in Minnesota. Our seminar, our webinar uh, recording will conclude in a few moments. Um, 
uh, or at 145, I hope. Uh, but if you are interested, as I mentioned before, Bill and Chris have agreed generously to give an extra 30 minutes of their time to answer any additional questions you might have. Uh, and the rest of the panel will now depart, but you can ask those questions through the Q&A format if you wish to continue to do so. I want to thank all of our panelists today for their outstanding contributions to this discussion. For now, our formal webinar session has concluded and I will sign off, but if you'd like to, if you'd like to stay, please do so. Thank you very much.